time, I want to introduce myself and welcome y'all to the series. Um, my name is Rahel Pekka. I am the communications manager at the Purchase Choice Budgeting Project. Um, this is the sixth and final event in a series um, of conversations and webinars and panels that we've been hosting um, since August um, called Visions for Justice. Um, and we launched Visions for Justice this summer to engage our partners to discuss how participatory practices and democracy beyond elections can really bring us closer to a more just world um, that is invested in communities, um, not in punishment and incarceration. Um, and we were really looking for a way to more intentionally and directly engage with all of you, our partners, um, including folks that are interested in learning more about PB and PD, people currently implementing PB, and other folks who might be interested in this work to really build and grow together um, and establish, you know, like a community of practice um, and a community of, of, of learning to, to use participatory practices, use divest invest frameworks to create a more just world. So to start us off, you're here, so you might already know this, but PBP, Participatory Budgeting Project, is an organization that empowers communities to decide together how to spend public money. Um, so real decision-making power in community hands is our central um, principle. We win, create, and uh, support implementation of PB processes, that's participatory budgeting processes across North America, um, in order to deepen democracy, build stronger communities, and make public budgets more equitable, effective, and transparent. Uh, so for more information on participatory budgeting, how it works, more about us, um, please check out our website at participatorybudgeting.org, um, sign up for updates, hear more about these kinds of events, um, and stay tapped into the amazing work that our partners are carrying forward across North America. Um, now today, I'm very, very excited um, about the conversation we're having, um, very excited about the, the folks who are joining us. Um, we have two incredible community leaders here, um, Diacha Jackson from Durham Beyond Policing um, and Inez Bordeaux, the Manager of Community Collaborations at Arch City Defenders. Um, and I'm really excited because we're going to get to hear about two really powerful campaigns and leave time to have question and answer. Um, so please drop any questions that you have um, in the chat um, or any comments if you're joining us um, on Facebook, and we'll bring those voices into the conversation as well. Um, so yeah, enough. Enough for me, um, Inez, Deatra, I'm going to leave it to you all to introduce yourselves. So just tell us a little bit about what brought you into this work and who you are. Um, Inez, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, my name is Inez Bordeaux. I'm the manager of community collaborations at Arch City Defenders um, here in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm also an organizer with the Close the Workhouse campaign. Um, what really brought me into the work is a very long story that we don't have time for today, but um, long story short, I'm a person that was chewed up and spit out of the criminal legal system in Missouri. I am a survivor of domestic violence. In 2009, my ex-husband picked up a hot skillet off of a stove and he burned me all over my body with it. And I did what they say that you're supposed to do. I left him, but I couldn't afford my child care. It was $1,600 a month. I couldn't afford it by myself and he refused to help. So like I committed a crime to not have to go back to my ex-husband. Um, my crime was after I got fired from two jobs, for lack of childcare, I was working as a nurse then. Also, I've been a nurse for 15 years in Missouri, in addition to all the other things. But um, I lost two jobs and I started getting unemployment benefits. And, you know, after not being able to afford my childcare and getting turned down by the state of Missouri three separate times for making $57 too much. Um, after I got fired from my second job, I kept overdrawing those unemployment benefits and that's how I paid my daycare. About a year later, um, a prosecutor here in Missouri decided that she was going to be tough on crime and fraud. And so I was one of 12,000 people that were prosecuted under a statute that turned out to be unconstitutional 
um, ruled unconstitutional by the Missouri Supreme Court. Um, so when we talk about this idea, when Arch City Defenders and the Close the Workhouse campaign talk about this idea of re-envisioning public safety, like what are the things that we need to actually make us safe, the things that we need to actually reduce crime and violence and therefore, you know, get out of this system, this, this horrible system of mass incarceration, like people need access to resources. That's what I needed. I needed access to affordable childcare. Um, I spent some time inside of the workhouse in 2016. During that seven year period that I was being chewed up inside of the criminal legal system, I spent six of those years on probation. And there was at one point I had, I missed an appointment with my probation officer and they issued a warrant for my arrest. And I ended up being inside of the workhouse for 30 days. The workhouse is a notorious hellhole jail here in St. Louis um, that is known for conditions like being infested with rats and roaches, being, uh, being, the water smells bad and the plumbing, the toilets don't flush and the showers don't work and there's no air conditioning inside of the workhouse. There's no, there's very little heat inside of the workhouse in the winters. And so I had heard all of these stories, but I didn't necessarily believe them because it was like, there's no way in the 21st century in the richest country on the planet in a major metropolitan city that we're holding people in these types of conditions. But once I got there, I found out that every single thing that I had heard about the workhouse was absolutely true. So once I was able to get out of the workhouse and I was able to get off probation and all of these other things, because again, the statute that was used to prosecute me was ruled unconstitutional. So once I got free and clear of the criminal legal system, um, one of the lawyers I knew at Arch City Defenders called me and he said, hey, Inez, we're starting a campaign to close the workhouse. Are you interested? And I was like, hell yeah, I'm interested. And so I just kept showing up to meetings and showing up and showing up and showing up. And eventually I was asked to be on the organizing team, um, which led directly to the job of manager of community collaborations at Arch City Defenders, which is really just a fancy way of saying organizer. I am a professional organizer that works in abolition and under, like I said, this giant umbrella of re-envisioning public safety. What does, when we say that we are talking about, what does it mean to take money away from the things that don't make us safe, like police and jails, and invest it in the people and the communities that need it most? So I went from volunteering to do something in between work and on my off days to literally getting paid to help tear down the systems of white supremacy and racism here in St. Louis. The, the workhouse is a living, breathing monument to white supremacy and racism. And it is literally the first domino that needs to fall in order for us to achieve this idea of true, true safety and true investment and for everyone in St. Louis to live and thrive. Yes, thank you so much for that. Um, and I love that domino. I love that domino metaphor because it's so real. Um, Beatrice, would you like to come in? Yes. Um... Hello, everyone. Thank you. Good evening here in, in East, East Coast time. Um, so my name is uh, Deatra Jackson, or Dee Dee. I am the National Director of BYP 100. Um, but maybe more importantly for this conversation, I am an organizer with Durham Beyond Policing um, and really honored to be here. Thank you all for having me. Um, and thank you, Agnes, for sharing your story. Um, it was very grounding and very inspiring. Um, I came into this work, I'm, I'm based in, in Durham, North Carolina, and I was uh, an organizer in the city, mostly working with college students across the state, um, really taking a look at the institutional racism that exists 
in, in colleges and universities across, across the country, but specifically in North Carolina. And I knew a group of, of organizers that were talking more and more about this new um, police headquarters that was being built in our city. And that the city was planning, the city of Durham was planning to spend $81 million on this police headquarters. Um, while at the same time, um, over 80% of, of the folks that are being evicted in the city are black women um, and so many other things that, that we needed at the time. And so uh, a group of us came together this included the BYP 100 chapter in Durham, along with the song chapter, Southerners on New Ground. Um, our, two, our two organizations, our chapters came together along with many other um, organ organizers that weren't in either of our organizations and decided to, to build a campaign that was um, going to stop the, stop the building of this $81 million police headquarters. And we were figuring out what were the demands that we really wanted to make? Um, what were the, the demands that really in, invited a Durham that was truly beyond policing? Um, and, and through many conversations, uh, we was able to build a demand around participatory budgeting. And we were learning about participatory budgeting and the project through really researching um, and also that some of us had the opportunity to actually go to a workshop uh, on participatory budgeting. How does it happen? What are the just the top level um, ideas around it? Um, and at the time, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina had had um, had one participatory budgeting in their city. And so we were really um, taking a look at that, how it would happen and what we would need to do. And so in building the campaign and in the process of, of taking a look at this $81 million police headquarters um, that has been built, has since been built, we were pushing really hard on, on participatory budgeting to also happen um, in our city. And, uh, Two things to know about Durham that is, that is really important around participatory budgeting is that we were moving in a direction where we were becoming one of the most progressive cities in the South. Um, so that included at the level of, um, of the economy, but also uh, and, and with the universities and also with our, our city, our, our elected officials. Um, and our school board, our, our school board actually is also one of the most progressive school boards. And so, um, and it's a small city. So our city is about 250, 260,000 people. Um, and so there's a way that we're able to push on things if our campaign is large enough that more people can hear it. So um, that's kind of the beginnings of, of, of the campaign and excited, very excited. I love talking about Durham Beyond Policing to talk more about how we, how we got here. Yes. Thank you both so much um, for, for really getting us started on a foot that feels very grounded in your specific localities, but also feels very universal in this way. Um, and you've already kind of laid out these visions, right, for, for, for justice. Um, uh, a thing that really struck me both in hearing both of you all talk um, about kind of like the longevity of your campaigns and the long-term vision was how we're in this really interesting place right now, um, where you know we are six days from this election that we cannot seem to escape talking about. Um, it's the elephant in the room. We are, I think, seven months into a quarantine for this global, whole global pandemic, right? Um, we are also, I literally realized yesterday, almost five months to the day um, of the murder of George Floyd um, in Minneapolis that sparked you know, all of these um, actions, but also uh, kind of re-brought attention to a thing that is ongoing um, and that for a lot of folks is not something that you ever forget about, right? Like that the kind of like domino metaphor that you use, Inez, really struck me because I think that so often what happens is we see this one big domino and it's like, this is the thing, or this is the spark, this is the uprising and we lose sight of the broader movement and all that's been going on and that all the like long-term work that is to come. Um, 
And then, you know, we're also the week of this, once again, another murder in Philadelphia. So we are finding ourselves in um, these narratives of like, this is the time, this is the first, this is the, 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 and yet y'all are working on like something broader and like this pressure cooker is nothing new, right? Like, yes, these are critical moments, but life and the fight for to defend black lives in particular is just a series of critical moments. And like, this is the time. Um, and that's how we move this work forward, right? Um, and so within that, I'm often thinking about this dynamic tension that exists between meeting the material needs right now. You were describing, you know, the, the conditions in the workhouse right now, Inez, and, and the need for like an immediate action, right? The, the tension between that and then a longer term vision and campaign strategy, bringing folks along, um, that push and pull between moving fast and moving considered, moving long term and moving short term. Um, and in Durham, I know that one thing that really strikes me about Durham Beyond Policing, actually a Durham Beyond Policing action was my first introduction to participatory budgeting. Um, when you all really brought to the community, like, what would you do with this amount of money? This is years ago. Um, and really like made these, you know, people talk about these police budgets, $81 million on a police headquarters. What does that really mean? What are you taking money away from in community in order to build this thing? And you really laid it out in this clear way. Um, you all have this nimbleness in terms of ha having a razor focus on what's next, what the vision is, what the immediate needs are, and then also balancing this um, ability to like really quickly mobilize. So Didi, I would love to just hear a little bit more about the strategy around in Durham Beyond Policing and how you all are managing to hold both long-term vision and immediate mobilization to meet the moment. Um, and I also know that y'all had a pretty significant win not too long ago. Um, so I would love to just hear about that. Yeah, thank you for this question. This is, this is a really good question. Um, so with, with Durham Beyond Policing, one of the things that we knew in the very beginning was that um, we didn't have the, the, the decision, the, the ear of the decision makers to win it immediately. Um, and so we really wanted to really zero in on and just interrogate this whole idea of building this $81 million police headquarters in the city. Um, and what that meant was like extreme push to talk to people. Um, because people that were in that neighborhood, because of course they, they built this new headquarters across the street from the projects, um, the people that were in that area did not know that this was happening. Um, and so the first piece of it was for us was like, oh, this is perfect. We're able to actually give this information and generate a conversation of like, how do you feel? Just as, sim as simple as a question of like, how do you feel about them building an $81 million police headquarters? Um, and coupling that with a question of like, well, if you had this kind of money, what would you do with it? Um, and that was the question that we were constantly pushing um, everyone. We would show up to city council, um, show up to city council meetings and work sessions and ask the people there, if you had this kind of money, what would you spend it on? Um, and we collected this information and utilized it to make sure that the people that were going to make the decision around building this headquarters knew that there were that there were folks, there were residents in the city that did not know it was it was being built. Number one, but also um, these are all the things that people named that they would spend this money on. Nobody named the police. Nobody named police cars, budgets, their shoes, their uniform, their hours. Nobody named it. Um, People, here's the things that they did name. People named mental health resources. People named better jobs. People named um, education and quality education and access to it. And just so many different things. And we were able to kind of keep that list going. Um, and it helped to build a bit of a narrative intervention uh, around what we were trying to do. The campaign and the people in it too are with are some of, of some of which are already in other political homes. And then this is the campaign work that you do, that they do locally. Um, and so the campaign has pretty much been all volunteer ran for the past four years. Um, we might have been able to scrape together, uh, you know, a little $500 a week for somebody to run our Facebook. But for the most part, it was it was just a true commitment. Um, from the people that were building it, from the chapters of the organizations that were in it, um, and 
we would meet. And, and we reached a point in, um, so we were able to, to put in, participatory budgeting was our demand from the very beginning. Um, and then we had a, a black woman that was running for city council that also put participatory budgeting on her platform from the very beginning. Um, and so that, in, that uh, offered an opportunity for us to engage with the rest of, of the elected officials that were going to be voting on it. And the first time that she attempted to get it through, she lost. She was the only person that voted for it. Um, nobody else on city council voted for it. And then uh, two years later, um, our campaign was still working and churning and doing our thing. And we heard that the police department was putting in and, and trying to get an additional 2.4, 2.5 million dollars. And so we was like, so that money could be participatory budgeting. Um, and we pushed and we met and we called and we made our own people's budgets. Um, and eventually we did win getting $2.4 million allocated to participatory budgeting in our city. Um, and we didn't just stop there. We, we, we stayed with it. So there was a whole um, board, a new city commission that was built just for participatory budgeting and moving this project along. And we knew we needed our people in those seats. Um, and so we pushed and pushed people from the campaign, find capacity, but we need to, we need to get our folks on here. Or if you don't have the capacity, find somebody that does, that is good, that will give us, you know, give us what we need to know about how this thing is moving. And there's, you know, there's limits to, to, to the participatory budgeting, at, at, you know, as you all well know. Um, but I think that there was, uh, we were able to really split the campaign and the campaign and there's folks that's focusing, really zeroing in on what is happening with the police budget. How are they actually trying to legitimize themselves, further militarize themselves, get more money. There's a group of people that's paying close attention to that. And there's a group of people that's thinking about the beyond policing part. When we say during beyond policing, what do we mean? How do we want to make that happen? And those two um, strategies really moving at the same time. Um, folks are, are incredibly committed and we're always bringing more people into the, into the conversation around this. Um, and so I think it's just been a perfect form, not a perfect, not at all perfect, but a very, very good formula um, for moving this kind of level of, of a campaign and is able to win very quickly, I would say, in terms of the past four years, winning, um, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour for city workers, um, full-time and part-time, uh, winning participatory budgeting in our city, winning a community safety and wellness task force that is meant to be an alternative to policing and figuring out more ways for it to be uh, an alternative to policing. These are the things that we're, and so we just are able to really build on that work, um, stopping the police expansion, all of that. Um, it, it just feels really crucial to what we're trying to do. I hope I didn't talk too long, I'm sorry. <laughs> You absolutely did not talk too long. No sorries over here. That was really helpful because I think a part of what I'm, <laughs> it's funny because I was like, how are y'all managing the, the tension, managing the balance? And you're like, well, we're doing it by balancing a lot of other things in order to, to, to make it happen, right? That you're holding down like the kind of divest and dismantle work while also moving forward the what are we building um, at the same time. And I heard a lot about deep relationship building and trust that's necessary in order to, once you have a win, be ready to like put people on the task force, be able to have any sort of accountability because you have um, that level of like formation. Um, and that, a, another part of what I heard you say is that this like piece of like, I don't wanna call it education necessarily, but I think it is education, right? Like popular education, of just like going and talking to people and being like, hey, did you know that this much money um, they don't got money to do this or that, but yet this is about to happen. And like doing that work is often what brings folks in. And, and that really just makes me think, Inez, about what you mentioned about like, you know, what you believed and didn't believe, you know, before you were faced with, um, with um, seeing the workhouse in person. And I know y'all are in St. Louis dealing with a lot of the same kind of competing priorities, right? Um, so I'm 
curious how you all are holding that tension and specifically with, with your campaign to, to close the workhouse, um, you've gained a lot of momentum, right? And also another win that I'm excited to hear about. Um, but in gaining that momentum, how are you all ensuring that the divestment conversations are being held hand in hand with the investment conversations? Because, you know, I can already hear I can already hear the city council meetings that are, oh, well, conditions are bad. If any money is allocated, it should be to fix it or to build another one or to, you know. So how are you all holding those investment conversations? I mean, they tried that and we repeatedly told them it was like lipstick on the on a pig. Um, the close, uh, the workhouse is irredeemable. It cannot be saved. Any money that you invest in it is a waste of taxpayer dollars. And we routinely tell anyone who will listen that we tell um, in St. Louis, we don't have a city council. We have a board of aldermen um, or alder people. Um, so <clears throat> just going back a little bit, we did have a huge win back in July. We, after two and a half years, we successfully pressured our board of aldermen to pass legislation to close the workhouse by December 31st of this year. So the workhouse will be closing this year. Um, and we, we, we applied that pressure by being really relentless, I think is how we were described. And I think it's pretty accurate. Um, we, we really started with the education piece. Um, I like to say that like in order to, you can't move, some people you can move their hearts, some people you can move their minds. And we put out two close the workhouse reports, one in 2018 and one in 2020, that was for like the numbers people, the people who needed to see the graphs and the pie charts and all of that. But the vast majority of people aren't moved by the numbers. They needed to hear the stories. Like I had heard the stories, but like I said, I didn't necessarily believe them because you know jail is not supposed to be a fun place and surely we're not doing this, so on and so forth. All the things that you know people say about jails. Um, but I believe that you have to break a person's heart. Like if you tell them a story that breaks their heart, like at that point, once their heart is broken open, you can literally pour information into them and they will receive it. So really the first year of the campaign, I know I personally told my story over a thousand times. Um, over a thousand times because the my personal story intersects with it intersects perfectly with what we were talking about this idea of criminalization of poverty and people not having access to resources and what happens to people when they're chewed up inside of the criminal legal system like I had to send my kids away my nursing license was suspended I spent three years homeless all because of not having access to resources. So we really just spent the first year talking to people and getting them to understand that everything that you have been force fed or brainwashed into believing about people that are inside of jails are not true. I've been inside of a jail. I was on probation. I like everything you've heard about me isn't true. And so once we broke people's hearts open through the number one rule of our campaign and even Arch City Defenders is that the impacted people who are closest to the problem are the one who know how, those are the people that know how to fix it. Poor people can tell you what they need. People who don't have access to resources can tell you what they need. You don't have to guess. All you have to do is listen to what they were saying. So impacted people run the Close to Workhouse campaign. Um, impacted people are the focal point of all of the work that we do at Arch City Defenders. So once we were able to break people's hearts open with the storytelling, listening to the stories of the people who had been subjected to the, un the unconstitutional inhumane conditions, then we started telling them, did you know we spend $16 million a year 
on, you know, on keeping the workhouse open? Did you know that the police and jails get 52% of the general fund budget in St. Louis? Did you know that our health department is so poorly funded that St. Louis year after year after year is number one in chlamydia and gonorrhea infections in the whole country? Like, did you know this? Did you know that? Did you know that we don't have a single full-time shelter for, for the unhoused in St. Louis? Did you know that we don't have a single center for domestic violence survivors in St. Louis? Did you know that there isn't one full-time walk-in treatment center for people who are dealing with drug addiction? Did you know, did you know, did you know? And then once we, once people started getting the connection of why are we giving $236 million to the police every year, but they don't solve any crimes and they don't prevent any crimes. So why are we giving them all of our money? Why are we locking poor, mostly black people up in a jail that where they're having to live in inhumane conditions? Why are we arresting so many people when we could be making sure that they have access to resources? And we just kept beating the drum over and over and over again. Anytime anyone would come and say, hey, can you talk about this? It didn't matter where it was. It didn't matter what time it was. Someone from the Close the Workhouse campaign was there talking to them. And we really focused on talking to people outside of the Black community, because people inside of the Black community know what's going on. We were preaching to the choir with them. I spent a lot of time in the wealthier, more affluent areas of the St. Louis region, talking to white people who did not have where there were no police officers inside of their schools, where there were no police officers standing guards at their gas stations or, or at their grocery stores, where there were no police officers patrolling and terrorizing their neighborhood. And I would go out and talk to them and say, you are living the abolition dream that we are trying to achieve already. You are already living the abolition that we want for myself. For, that I want for my children. And so through beating that drum, breaking people's hearts, filling them up with information, introducing them to people who had been inside of the system, the, the tide started to turn and we picked up momentum really, really quick. When we started talking about how police only spend 4% of their time dealing with violent crime, why aren't they solving any crimes? They don't prevent crimes, they don't solve crimes. So what are they doing? Don't you think it would be better if we took $20 million out of the $236 million that the police get and invested in affordable housing? Why can't we build a drug treatment program center instead of you know, a new jail? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do that? And like I said, the momentum um, picked up really, really quickly. And then we also made it an election issue. Um, our older people are reelected every two years and they do odd number wards and even, and even number wards on opposite years. When it came time for the president of the board of aldermen race, like it was an election issue. There wasn't a single elected official who could go anywhere. You couldn't go to a restaurant. You couldn't be seen in the grocery store without someone saying, where do you stand on close the workhouse? Because closing the workhouse isn't just about closing a jail. Yes, it's about closing a jail. Yes, it's about getting black people and poor people out of this facility and back home to their communities where they belong. But it's also about ending cash bail because cash bail is what allows the workhouse to exist. If you have bail money, then you can get out of jail. If you don't, you know, you can't. And the average income for a black family inside of St. Louis City is about $25,000. If you steal an iPhone, the judge is gonna slap you with the bail, that's $25,000. Can you afford that? No, so what happens? Um, so we just started beating, beating the drum and there was nowhere that people could go without having to answer this question. And then slowly but surely, when this campaign started two and a half years ago, we started out with three of our 28 older people who were vocal supporters of closing the workhouse. Within a year, we were up to 11. 
earlier this year, we got to 15, which was the majority we needed to get that legislation passed. And let me tell you something. The pressure that we built was so great. The movement that we built inside of St. Louis was so good that the president of the Board of Aldermen, we were on the eve of passing legislation to close the workhouse. And he did some magic finagling, some democracy destroying moves to keep our legislation from passing. And then the following Monday, he introduced his own legislation to close the workhouse. And when it came down to it, we got a 28 to zero unanimous vote to close the workhouse. There were people on that same Zoom call when they were having the meeting saying, I don't know if I believe in this, I don't know if I support it, but you know what, they voted for it anyway because they, would, they knew what would happen if they didn't. They knew that we would be at their doorsteps. They knew that we would be at City Hall. They knew that we would mobilize our huge base. Our base isn't just white people, but it um, isn't just black people. It wasn't just impacted people. It was white people. It was Latinx people. It was Asian people. We had a, we built a broad coalition and we forced them into doing what was right um, by simply asking, do you believe Black Lives Matter or they don't. Like you can't say Black Lives Matter and wanna keep this hellhole jail open. You can't say Black Lives Matter and you're okay with keeping poor black people in jail pre-trial. Like they haven't been convicted of anything. You can't say Black Lives Matter and wanna keep this jail open. And there are no fences out here. You are either with us or you are against us. And if you are against us, we will show up at your house and we will paint resign in the street in front of your house. We will have dance parties until three o'clock in the morning. And then we will show up at City Hall by 9 a.m. to protest during your meeting. And we will not stop. And we didn't, and they listened, they heard us and they got this legislation through. So it was it was a huge win. And I, I don't even really think I answered your question. Um, the, Closing the workhouse and the work we do at Arch City Defenders has always been life or death. We have always been able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have always been able to, you know, pat our heads and rub our bellies at the same time because people's lives depend on it. The lawyers and the people, the lawyers at Arch City Defenders and the social workers, like, are literally get handling people's criminal cases, their civil cases, they're getting their warrants recalled, they're getting their, their tickets taken care of, and all of these things have immediate impact on their lives. Sometimes it's short term, sometimes it's long term. And as far as close to workhouse, the immediate impact was we needed to get people out of this jail. And one of our partners is the St. Louis chapter of the Bail Project. We have a chapter here in St. Louis and in the last two years, they've bailed 3,300 people out of jail. When this campaign started, there was about 550 people inside of the workhouse. Last year, about January of last year, there was about 220 people inside of the workhouse. Today, there's 71 people inside of the workhouse. So like, that was the immediate need that we had and the work and the bail project does that. The lawyers at Arch City represent some of those people so they do that. And then the long-term vision is closing this jail and making sure that that $16 million gets allocated through a participatory budgeting process. And we insisted that it be done through a participatory budgeting process because it's the black people and the poor people that live in these communities that have been terrorized by the police who have been victims of this racist system that keeps locking them up generation after generation. So we wanted those people to have the say, not Arch City Defenders, not Action St. Louis, not the Bail Project, but the black people inside of those communities. And we, we won't accept anything less, period. So that's where we are. Yes, 
you are like you thoroughly answered my question and like a dozen of my follow-up questions so thank you so much Inez because that a lot of what I heard you say was a lot of the very similar right this walk and chew gum at the same time thing like this is nothing new to the folks who are organizing in this way and even you know the painting resign in front of your house will also throw a dance party like that that just shows like how there is like this you know multitude of, of tactics um, and the consistency is what really stood out to me and that kind of consistency going back to what Didi said about like having to reach back out to your folks and be like we need to keep going, right? So find the capacity, reach out to your network. Let's let's find the capacity together because it's a shared capacity. It's not one person, you know, who's doing the action and putting up bail and doing the, like, you know, it's all of us, right? And finding that collective um, imagination and like that collective resilience and strength and strategy to be able to move the work forward and have a constant drumbeat. Um, Thank you so much for that. That was really amazing. Um, and the numbers really are what struck me in a huge way at, near the end. Like that's truly wild. Like I'm, I'm speechless, right? So hearing that um, is really incredible. And I, I just wanna remind folks in the chat and on Facebook, like if you have any questions or any comments or anything that comes to mind as you're hearing this, um, please, um, drop that into the chat. One question that did come up is, uh, is the workhouse city owned, um, county owned or private? It's city owned. Okay. We have a lawsuit against the mayor, the city, the workhouse right now that yes. is pending, um, that we filed back in, I think 2018. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's definitely city owned. Um, unfortunately, but maybe not for long because it's closing at the end of the year, so. Nobody we'll owned, right. Here, <laughs> no one looking owned. for a plot of land in St. Louis in an <laughs> industrialized area, you know, I happen to know where maybe. Yes, I love this as a framework too. We should just do this like na nationwide, right? Convert, <laughs> convert these jails into plots of land, for real. Um, both of y'all really, got me excited when you were talking about collective capacity um, and, and the importance of like community in all of this, right? And, and building out this campaign um, as well as decision makers. Um, and a part of what I always wonder about when we, when we talk about this like founding assertion of PDP and an assertion of like a lot of the work that we do, which is that part that the people closest to the pain or closest to the problem are closest to the solution, that people know what they need in order to thrive. Um, people know what's missing and people know what they have. Um, and in hearing y'all talk about this like shared capacity and this like broad imagination, I couldn't help but wonder like in the ways that each of your campaigns have grown um, and the coalitions that you've been able to build, what things stand out as, as what's next, as what we're building. Um, and this also brings us to the question that we're going to ask um, at the end of this, and we're going to ask folks in the chat as well, is the founding kind of thing of this whole conversation series was to talk to people about how participatory practices and participatory budgeting help us realize that, right? We say that that community knows what we need. We say that we know that systems of incarceration are not bringing us any closer to what we need. And we also say that our communities are so resilient, but also so imaginative and creative um, so we're asking folks, what are your visions for justice? And I'm going to ask both of you that when we wrap up later. So just wanted to set that out there as well. And I'm going to ask folks in the chat as well, just to, to spell out your vision and to really take us on an imagination um, journey with you. Um, but like my initial question, like in talking to community, what are some, some things that came out as, as what's next and, and what we're building in the place of these harmful systems? Either one of y'all. I can go first. Um, yeah. Okay, so what's next? Um, what we are doing right now. So last year, 
uh, in in Durham, there was uh, the police put in, the police always need more money. So that's the other thing too, is like, they will find a reason to need more money. They always need more money. And um, last year, our police department put in a proposal to add 72 new cops to the force. And our little campaign got together, turned up at the city council meetings, was like, hell no, what, why, why? This is just uncalled for. Here's all the things that this money could go towards. There is no real, they're not, they're, this isn't a legitimate reason because of work hours. Like, no, we don't need this. Um, and we were like, instead of hiring 70 top, 72 new cops, why don't you hire 72 community members to actually figure out what are the ways that we can um, build more community safety, more wellness that do not involve the police. Um, and we created this proposal and it is multi-leveled. It is at the school level because we have push around getting cops out of schools too and implementing more, um, more less punitive, more restorative justice practices in our public schools, um, pushing for um, mental health resources and also mobile, mobile crisis units, um, which means that that has to exist at the county level because that's where our public health department um, and then at the city level really pushing on um, there to be more programming where, where people are navigating how to deal Sorry, my phone was ringing. Um, <laughs> how to really deal with conflict that, that is going to happen in our, in our communities. Um, and then also like what to do about the 80 per, over 80% of people that are in the jail for what we would call poverty crimes. They're mostly in there for larceny. That's most of the folks that are in there. And the same thing here, um, people are in jail um, before they are, before they, before they, before trial, before they are charged, um, and and those are poverty crimes, right? So just doing this deep interrogation, and so at the city level, at the county level, and at the school level, um, a year later, we were able to get just literally like last month, um, we're able to get our full proposal um, through with um, with the people on it that we that we knew we needed. So we knew we wanted people um, uh, impacted by the criminal justice system, which is which is mostly all Black people, but particularly um, formerly incarcerated people. We knew we wanted um, um, the family or family of or a parent of um, someone that has um, that has been a victim of of gun violence and by by police violence. Uh, we knew that we wanted. Um, folks that are already engaged in the community. Um, and we were able to set the standards of the people that were going to make up this task force. Um, and we were and we pushed and pushed at the county and the city level to get those things through. So literally on Friday is the deadline for the application for people that want to be on this task force. Um, and so we're pushing on our people, obviously, to be in there um, and to and to push through our, our ideas and keep the campaign moving on that end. Um, I think the thing to just the, to notice is that the more and more that we push on our city council and our county commissioners, it's it there's a strategy there of, of getting closer and closer, which is a risk, right? Because um, it, it's a it puts our campaign at risk. Um, it puts our values at risk by being so close to these elected officials and relying so heavily on them to be the people that push through the vision that, that and say yes to the vision that we already know we need. Um, and so uh, pulling on, uh, on Inez's metaphor of, of walking and chewing gum, um, we have our campaign split up into these different working groups to really manage how do we move forward on a strategy and getting the people that are going to say yes to say yes to us and um, how do we make sure we're doing the same thing at the same time but outside of the outside of the state um, and really relying on the organizers that have built this campaign and so the same time that we put in a proposal for this task force to run this like huge county citywide survey to figure out what people need and what's going on we're going to run our own survey um, from our campaign 
um, that is going to be alongside it, that is not going to um, whitewash what people have to say. It's not going to whitewash what people say that they need. It's going to have the true, the, the truth, the real, all of that. Um, and we and we are going to make sure that we are also serving the people that we need, um, the the voices that we that need to be heard. Um, and so we're moving these two trains at the same time um, and we feel very committed to it um, because we wanna make sure that we are, like abolition is at our core and that means not relying on the state, um, which is part of the limit of participatory budgeting, right? It's like once it, it's one in your city, you have to, and Anna is just something to look out for, like even once it's one in your city, they basically do have a lot of control over how it looks, how it sounds, who it goes out to, who it reaches. They have a lot of power over that. And that was, that's was that been one of the limits is like, lots of people do not feel represented in that process. Um, but really continuing to move forward and develop, how do, how do we learn from this? How do we learn how governing even works? Um, how do we, like all of those things are, are useful and, and they're um, technologies that we need ultimately. Um, and making sure that alongside this, alongside um, this push around the community safety and wellness task force um, at, by the government and our local government, we're also doing abolition labs with the campaigns and with our base, with our campaign and with our base, um, learning about transformative justice processes, doing doing those things that we know need to be done, um, and we're doing that while also. Um, pushing forward at the at the inside level is what we call it. I did not answer your question around my vision, though. <laughs> what no, it's say, okay. We're gonna close out with that. <laughs> you don't have to yet. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. You have that. <laughs> um. Okay. So, what's next for us? Um. Of course, after we make sure that the workhouse closes this year and we get the participatory budgeting process off the ground. And Didi, we try to anticipate exactly what you were talking about, like having elected officials, their hands all in the process and wanting a piece of the money and all of that. When we wrote our Participatory, participatory budgeting bill, we wrote all of the elected officials completely out of the process. They have no power. All of the power goes to the people. And then there are certain stipulations around that. Like you cannot be an elected official or plan to be an elected official within like the next three years and things like that. Like this is strictly regular, regular folks that are going to be in the participatory um, who will be on um, what we're calling like the people's council for the participatory budgeting process. Um, but after that, we, we've got a bunch of things that we're thinking about. Um, number one is defunding the police. They are the biggest expenditure in the city. They get 52% of our budget. 52%, like we literally can't afford to do anything else until we take some of that money away from the police. And right now they're talking about hiring an additional 100 police officers. Um, we're fighting against that with all of our might because St. Louis is not a big city. It's only about 300,000 people and we have more police per capita than any other police department in the country, while also that same police department kills more people per capita than any other police department in the country. So we're not interested in them um, adding an additional 100 cops at the cost of like $9.8 million a year and again, swelling their budget. So our plan, I mean, we wanna, syst we wanna systematically dismantle the police department <clears throat> piece by piece. First, by um, putting a freeze on the hiring so they cannot hire those additional cops. And then taking some of the departments or some of, yeah, some of the departments within the police department um, away outside of the police. For, existent, for example, the traffic division, why does that need to be 
a department in the police department? Like, why do we need people with badges and guns pulling people over for speeding and so on and so forth? That doesn't need to be in there. The, the department that handles domestic violence and sexual assault, that doesn't need to be handled by the police department since most of, um, since, you know, a lot of those crimes are perpetrated by the police anyway. So like sy systematically dismantling it like one piece at a time until it no longer exists in any real way. Um, handling the militarization of the police in St. Louis, getting rid of the SWAT team. And we have something here called um, the Real Crime Center where there's like these kiosk things all over the city getting rid of the, you know, surveillance, the little surveillance drone things that they have in different neighborhoods that further criminalize people cost us money and don't have any real effect. Um, and then like, as we're, like I said, we can walk and chew bubblegum at the same time. So while we're dismantling the police department, we want to tax the rich. Like there are some rich people and some corporations in St. Louis that are getting over by not paying their fair share. So we wanna make sure that they begin to pay their fair share. Things like capital gains and things like that. We have a tax policy expert that is one of the organizers um, with the campaign who is helping us with getting that legislation and starting to get those talking points and educational pieces around that. Um, and then I think a little further down the line, we want to dismantle the all of the all of the police departments in the St. Louis region. In St. Louis City and St. Louis County, we have 87 different municipalities in this region. 80 seven. There are all these little small townships that only have like three or 4,000 people living in them and they have their own court system, their own jail, their own police department. Why? Well, I know why. It's to generate revenue. But like we want to dismantle all of those things and dismantle some of these uh, predatory courts and court practices in some of these smaller municipalities. So um, we've got big plans, but again, we've got to make sure the workhouse closes first. That's the first domino that needs to fall and then everything else um, will come after that. Yeah, and y'all are right there to push down the next domino. That's what's up. This is yeah. great. So we're we're lining up the dominoes and then pushing them down. You sure are. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's funny because like in hearing both of y'all talk, I'm always struck by the the fact that when people talk about the policing system, carceral system, all of that, people are always like, there's been this shift in our language where we no longer say, oh, it's broken. There's been an, an actual understanding. Like, no, it's working exactly how it was meant to. Also, abolition is an organic thought, right? It's, it's the, the way that nature was intended. Like prisons, jails, police, a person pulling you over in your car with a gun, like all of this is inorganic. It's not of nature. Um, yet it's like incredibly self replicating, right? Like it grows and grows and grows and grows. And what you were saying, Didi, about like the police will always find a way to need more money. And what you just mentioned, um, I know is about like all these townships, all these court systems, all these jail systems in order to make money, um, but also in order to make sure that the web of this system is just just woven tight enough um, that it feels in it, like not enterable but y'all are like really doing a great job of like pulling apart those threads um and even the talk of like the bail system right i live in california and there's a whole back and forth going on in california about um bail bonds and and how we get rid of bail and then potentially replace it with an algorithm you know the algorithm's gonna be racist. So it's so there's a lot here. Um, and that if you're not careful, right? Um, you know, you gotta look every gift horse in the mouth because this system is very good. 
at presenting a solution that's actually just a growth of it in organic matter. So the system is always recalibrating. That's what it is. The system is always recalibrating. You take away a jail or you take away cash bail, then there's an algorithm or there is an ankle bracelet or there's an app on your phone. Like it's always consistently recalibrating. So that's why we've got to cut it off at the root all together. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And we're all, and we, you know, the walking and chewing gum, it keeps, that, that seems to be the theme of this, of this time that we're talking together, right? Of holding all the attention at the same time. Um, I have one more question for y'all before we ask you your visions for justice. Um, I know when you talked about the land um, sovereignty, that really got people excited. And this idea of reclaiming um, the resources that are taken um, in order to perpetuate this system that's recalibrating like, like a virus, yeah. But inorganic, we gotta remind ourselves, it's not organic. Um, so are there any elements, Didi, in the work in Durham that have some of this reclaim energy to them as well? A part of what I heard both of y'all talking about was like this fact, okay, like in, in, uh, in Durham being like, all right, y'all want 72 cops? Actually, matter of fact, how about you hire 72 community members to do something that's useful? Um, or like in uh, St. Louis, there's this land now that's actually going to be able to be of, of something beneficial. Um, what are some examples of reclamation, reclaiming anything that comes to mind? And then I also wanna leave you both space um, to ask one another a question um, and then we'll move to our vision. Yeah, um, a couple of examples uh, come to mind is uh, one, um, and as when you were saying that the workhouse was a living, breathing um, entity of, of white supremacy, I, I immediately thought about the um, Confederate monuments that are across North Carolina. And in Durham in, in 2017, um, what I like to tell the story about this is that the city of Durham decided it was time for one of the Confederate monuments to go. Um, and the one that is in our downtown, in downtown Durham, right outside of the courthouse. And uh, folks uh, t decided to take the statue down. Um, and that was one of the first places that I experienced a, a sense of rec reclamation, um, a sense of um, you know, I'm not from Durham, but my family is from Durham. And I know for a fact that my grandmother, when she was in college, walked past this monument several times um, go at, while, while hanging out in downtown Durham um, and got, getting a chance to really be there when it came down to really reclaim that space. Um, reclaim that we're, we are taking down white supremacy by any means necessary. Um, so that's one place. Um, another place is, as I was say, saying before, there's uh, they they decided that they built the seventy one million dollar police headquarters, um, brand new from scratch, which means that there's an old building um, where we did do the action um, that that showed the displayed the participatory budgeting. Um, that building is still vacant, um, and what not particularly Durham Beyond Policing, but some of the organizations that are in Durham Beyond Policing have been holding um, over the past two or three years, the series of conversations of what should happen with this building. Um, do we want it? Do we want that energy? Like, do we want to take the, you know, put in that, that the energy of, of, of violence and, and hardship and trauma that has been brought on our people? Do we even want to do something with that? Um, is it is it worth what it may cost us, um, or do we do we want to reclaim it? We need more housing in the city. Uh, we don't we don't we also don't have full time um, shelter sheltering for for folks that are experiencing homelessness in the city. Can it be reclaimed for that purpose? And it's literally been vacant for the past um, year. The the new headquarters opened up a year ago, and it's been vacant since then. Um, and so folks are in conversations around that. Um, I. I I don't know where they where they are, um, but I think that, that there is some energy churning around uh, what to do in particular with this building, and it's helping to really be, bring in different perspectives from the community um, around what should happen. 
We are also having a lot of discussion about what should happen um, with the workhouse and the land. Um, I have had the very strong belief that the workhouse should be burned to the ground, um, but I'm told that it's not good for environmental reasons, so I'm willing to back off of that. Um, I personally would like to see, I want to see the workhouse demolished. It's a jail. There are several older people who are like, no, we don't want another vacant building because we do have a lot of vacant buildings in St. Louis. Like, we don't want another vacant building. Like, we should do something with it. There is an alder who has several halfway houses in her ward, and she wants to use the workhouse for that. The problem is, like, the workhouse is is it's not redeemable. It just isn't. There is black mold and there's asbestos in the boilers. And the amount of money that we would have to invest in it to fix it up and make it usable and safe for other people, it's just not worth it. It's also in an industrial area. There's no bus line out there. There's no grocery stores or anything that would make the area really livable. So. I don't know what the plan is for the land. Um, it, it used to be a landfill, so I'm not sure how viable it is for other things. Like they covered up a landfill, a landfill, and they built a jail on top of it. The water smells funny inside of the workhouse, so I'm not sure that anything should be done with it. The best I can think of is maybe a monument to the lives that have been lost inside of the workhouse. Hundreds of people have died in there over the, over the years. Um, a monument to the people who have died inside of the workhouse, a monument to the families and neighborhoods that were lost and destroyed due to the racist policies that allow the workhouse, that allowed the workhouse to exist. Um, Sometimes I feel like it's okay to just let it go, you know, let it overgrow, let animals and other wild creatures like live there and do like, I don't, I don't have, I don't have a good answer for what should be done with the land. I do know I want that building destroyed. So if there is a way that we can do that environmentally responsibly, I'm going to sign up for that option. <laughs> That's very real. And you, yeah, <laughs> oh, the, the like reality of hearing like they, they built a jail on top of a landfill. There's a lot, a lot there. Um, it was the 60s, there's a lot there. so they didn't know as much then as we know now, but yeah, they built a jail on top of a landfill. Yeah, they didn't know or they didn't care and who knows. Yeah, um, I hear you. I I feel like there is like this immense pressure to um, know every step of the way, but it's like, nah, like it's really what we know is it needs to go. And so that's, that's a real answer. You totally answered the question. That's it right there. That's how you reclaim it is by making it go away. Um, so I do wanna ask y'all um, to share with us your visions for justice before we wrap up. And within those, if you have any questions for one another, please feel free to, to ask them. Um, a couple of visions in the chat. The chat is really popping with visions for justice today. So I really just want to like lift up some of it. Um, there was conversation about restorative practices in schools that have not been co-opted um, by institutions, um, transformative justice, food sovereignty, um, Black trans women are safe and valued, community uh, shake. Uh, the communities that we live in. This is the thing that I always say. I'm like, you know, I, to even know how the things in your community are being shaped, right? Um, both of y'all talked about political education. Uh, someone in Chicago really uh, breaking down the ways that like developing outreach to older people is helping them get closer to their vision um, and lifting up uh, social determinants of health um, and confronting those causes explicitly. Um, Food sovereignty, I'm, yeah, I love to hear it. I love to hear that because it's something that I don't think about nearly enough. Um, so yeah, so Inez, Beatra, like thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing these incredible campaigns with us. 
Um, you both really brought me a lot of hope um, in a really strange day, in a really strange month, in a really strange year. Um, and I appreciate y'all for that. Um, so uh, which one of y'all wants to share your vision for justice first? <laughs> Just three eyebrows. <laughs> okay, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> I don't really have a lot of super specific things when I think about my vision for justice. It's it's more of a like a feeling. I want Black people to be free in every way, just to be able to live and go about our business without having to worry about like the police harassing me or my family, not having to worry about where my next meal comes from, being in community with my neighbors, knowing that my children are getting a full and robust education that they are able to see themselves in, me being able to be my black ass self all the time without reservation, never having to code switch again, never having to explain my natural hair again, never having to, you know, do any of those things, just, just being able to be free and take a deep breath without having to worry about things that other communities don't have to worry about. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there, there's so, there's so much, yo. Like I couldn't, I could sit on here for another hour and talk about <clears throat> housing justice and environmental justice and reproductive justice and abolition and being free from the police and having access to full mental, mental health services and healthcare, like having access to all of those things and just being able to live and not have to spend every day trying to survive. You know what I'm saying? Having elected officials who know where I have been, who have been through the things that I have been through and understand and act in my best interest and not in their personal interest. Like all, all of these different things. I just want to be free to raise carefree Black sons. You know what I'm saying? I, ha I, I have a 19-year-old daughter. So I mean, also just carefree Black kids, but really these sons, you know what I'm saying? Like these boys and them just being able to walk free and my 17 year old being able to have on his AirPods and walk to the bus stop to go to work with his hood up and a backpack on and not have to worry about, is he gonna make, make it home? Like all of these different things. I just want the liberation of black folks in whatever that looks like for that particular black folk. So, I'm sorry, I don't have more specifics. There's no sorry there. There's no sorry there. You said a, a deep breath and I found myself taking a deep breath as you spoke. Um, and so yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing that vision. Dee Dee? Yeah, I want everything Anna's just said. I want all of that, I, <laughs> every single, everything that was on that menu. I want that. Um, and, and I think about, I, I think about safety a lot, um, especially like within the, the campaign and the current moment that we're in, uh, in, in safety and we know, and what we've been saying on this is that we know that the police and prisons and punitive measures do not equate to safety. They never have. And the only safety to me looks like uh, organized communities. It looks like, and so my vision for justice is permanently organized communities, um, that there is always 
access to food, that there is always access to, to childcare and adequate ed education. Um, and folks feeling like they know who's around them, they know what they're about, they know their purpose, and everybody has a role in helping to ensure that folks do live and not just survive. Um, that that's really my that's as far as I'm, like what Inez said that feeling with having permanently organized communities um, because I, I won't um, you know I used to believe that there would be this like whiz can't you feel a brand new day moment forever and that is what it liberation is um and that day will come and then after that we still gonna have to organize and, and be with each other and figure out how to be with each other so after can't you feel a brand new day we are still organizing yes i love it when music comes into it because now i'm gonna have to go listen to that and watch the whiz um, so I'm going to be a cheater and be like, I want a little bit, I want all of what Inez laid out. I want all of what BD laid out and then some, um, my vision for justice is really based around this like narrative of resilience that, um, black communities, immigrant communities, queer folks like get right. Um, that things happen, bad things happen. And then it's like, oh, our communities are resilient. We can get through. And I, my vision for justice is one where the resilience of our communities translates into a desire to protect and value our communities rather than just see what more we can put up with, see what more we can fight through, right? Um, I think that my vision for justice is really based on relationships um, and being able to hear one another and being able to build relationships and organize through them. Um, my vision for justice is one where we're not talking necessarily about uh, justice in the ways that we talk about it right now, right? In, in, in a world where we aren't always trying to figure out how to combat what we're facing, but we're instead able to talk about what we want, about what's next, to be able to just like laugh and have joy together. Um, and yeah, um, there's more incredible visions in the chat. One more time, Didi, Inez, thank y'all both so much for joining us. Also, just thank y'all both so much for the campaigns that you're working on, for the amazing other work that you're doing, and also just for like outside of campaigns, outside of this work, just for being who y'all are um, in this in this world. What a pleasure to like be here with y'all. Um, again, my name is Rahel Tekka, communication manager at um, PVP. This is the last in our Visions for Justice series, but there's some like we're going to be pushing stuff out around it because so much amazing stuff came out of these conversations and more than a couple songs. Interestingly, these visions actually did bring forth some music for folks. So looking forward to more of that as well. Um, and that's that's a wrap for tonight. Thank you all both so, so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you all for having me. Yeah. Um.